I'm gonna pose a question to you. Well, screen yes, forward. So let's think about the following number: twenty nine point seven four seconds. That's a weird number, but I would like you to come up um, with some possibilities. What this means, what the number represents, um, what it could be. Is it a ninety nine point nine seven? SLO, which is a weird number, but could be. Um, probably isn't. So let's let's see what it actually is. Um, 29.74 seconds is all it took this guy to become the fastest person in the world. Um, it's uh, for the people who don't know it, it's Usain Bolt. And to actually win an Olympic medal, that's all it took. There's a preliminary, there's a semi final, there's a final. 30 seconds, under 30 seconds, done, gold medal. But of course, Usain Bolt did not train for just um, 30 seconds. It actually took him way more um, time to actually do this. It, winning a gold medal does not just take 30 seconds. It takes many hours, many days of training, pain, probably a bit of blood, probably a bit of even being disgruntled at some point in time. Um, so when we, when we think of athletes, we think of the Olympics or the World Cup or the European Championships, uh, football at the moment going on. But actually what they do in day-to-day -day life is not running uh, Olympic finals. What they do is hard graft, um, just like us, actually, just like engineers. For, uh, that's the the hard graph is what we see. The Olympic medals is unfortunately not what we get. If hopefully we get a pat on the back. Um, and Flo doesn't want to talk about football. It's, neither do I, but it slipped in. Um, so what we talk about athletes, that what we actually should be talking about is the amount of effort they put in to train, not the dusty televised events. Um, because it takes over 10K hours to become an expert. Um, and that's the stuff we don't see. Well, actually, what, what Malcolm Gladwell said is that on average, it takes an expert 10,000 hours to learn that craft. Um, and if we translate this to other high pressure uh, professions like pilots, like firemen, we actually also know they do not um, fly planes all the time, they do not put out fires all the time without actually training how to do this. Uh, because when they get it wrong, they act, people actually die. So when in these professions, they actually emphasize the training more than the, the actual uh, output we think of uh, when we look at firemen, with the burly firemen, the cool pilots in their um, nice little outfits. No, what they actually also do is they spend loads of time in uh, simulations, not just practice, actual simulations, because people respond differently to. Bram, quick question. Are you sharing your slides or are you supposed to be sharing slides? That's what people are asking in the chat. I am sharing my slides, yes. We're, we're not seeing anything yet, so let's troubleshoot oh. that real quick, shall we? Uh, 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 uh. Let me reshare. Just gonna look to the side to see if people are. Yay! I see thumbs ups. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No pro. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> for otherwise, there's a crazy man waving in his empty bedroom. Um, so yeah. So if we quickly go back to the slides. So what you missed is actually showing Usain Bolt doing a smiley face running, actual training, and then like some quotes, and this is where we back are. So when we think about pilots, when we think about uh, firemen, they actually do lots and lots of training, um, not just um, helping us out, and that's what we, we think they do, but they also do a lot of training. And that's because when they get stuff wrong, people die. That's a very intrinsic motivator, basically, to practice. Um, whereas in engineering, unless you actually run the software that runs the 
the traffic control, probably when our software craps out, nobody really dies. We'll lose money. Sometimes we lose a lot of money, but nobody dies. So we, as engineers, we have very different intrinsic motivations to get stuff done. But if we have another look at, at pilots, or in this case, also doctors, we didn't have a nice little picture of a doctor doing a checklist, they also do a lot, a lot of, of checklists to make sure that um, think run books in our in our world that when they boot up a plane it actually happens in the sequence that is supposed to happen and that all the buttons that are supposed to be on and all the buttons that are supposed to be off are actually on and off um, again that's not something we think of when we see cool pilots or see uh, when we interact with doctors um, but most of the time they're actually talking to patients they're uh, doctors are talking to patients. Doctors are actually doing checklists. I've had the unfortunate uh, event in my life that I've been operated on a couple of times, and I know for a fact that's what they do. Every time I was moved from one room to the next, I got the same questions. I got, uh, like, what's your name? What's your date of birth? What uh, what leg are, you, are we operating on today? And, of course, in the third room, it got annoying. But for them, it's a way to make sure that actually, you know, they're not taking off, well, in my case, operating on the wrong leg. So checklists in those professions that have very severe outcomes if stuff goes wrong, checklists and simulations are very, very important. In our case, when we try to translate this to, um, to, our, uh, to our way of life, um, microservice coming in, Kubernetes coming in, or in, let's say, uh, scheduling platforms, because other tools are available. Um, we actually also know that most of the time we'll probably be running in, in a degraded state. But on the customer facing end, we need to make sure that they don't feel any adverse effects. So how can we use the, um, the observations we've made with other uh, professions, and how can we translate this to, to our line of work? Well, for one is, can we actually figure out if your platform is in an error state? Um, back in the days when you basically had a front end, a back end, and some application server, it was pretty, pretty simple. Or, well, was it simple? Because most of the time people, well, the, the first line of defense was basically your help desk. People yelling angrily at you that, um, some stuff, some form, or some Excel sheet wasn't being generated. Um, so that actually got a name in our world. So chaos engineering. Can we? Well, since we actually know that we are in a degraded, probably in a degraded state, can we actually inject this this failure? at a concentrate, or perhaps not at a concentrate, but can we at least inject it into production? Um, because uh, knowledge, measuring, measuring is knowledge. So instead of hoping that, um, well, not hoping, waiting for something to fail, and then hopefully the grumpy old guy in the basement has seen it before, so that we can actually act to uh, to fix it, or can we not even act, probably we'll have to figure out first what, what is wrong. So we need to have someone that seen it before, um, and then we can build from there. Whereas Chaos Engineer actually says, no, what we're going to do is we're going to inject constantly failure into our system, because if we expect it to be in a failure state, we might as well put it in a failure state and make sure that we actually survive it. Of course, that's an um, ideal world where we want to be end up in, but that's something to aim for. Um, the, when we step back, how did chaos engineering come about? The guys at um, at Netflix, or the people at Netflix, I should say, um, had the same idea, and they invented a Chaos Monkey and eventually an entire Simian army that could basically pull plugs on their AWS system. Um, the original Simian army has been abandoned, I would say, and even the rewritten re Chaos Monkey that highly develops on Spinnaker um, 
seem to be uh, not really developed anymore. But the, the, we've, the ideas that they brought into the world, basically injecting failure, deliberately injecting failure, uh, not just at the weekend, not just in our acceptance platform, but we do it all the time, especially in production. They managed to take down um, AWS uh, availability zones, um, but they, uh, we actually learned from, from that. And that actually brings me to the next little little bit. Um, Chaos Monkey, Chaos Engineering is is a is a goal to do it in production. It was actually it's even a goal to do it um, in the first place, because Chaos Monkey, Chaos Engineering, most of the time when I do it, when I like to think about it, it has a very destructive component. Um, so we need to make sure that we can survive destructive behavior of, of Chaos Monkey, of whatever tooling um, we come up with. Because as I said, Chaos Monkey, current, the current iteration of Chaos Monkey is, is quite uh, restrictive in what you can do with it, especially the, inter the dependency on Spinnaker seems to, to me uh, a shame. But the other tools have basically been developed. If you look at the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem, Chaos Testing actually grew its own ecosystem. So more people are, are thinking about it um, than ever. Um, competing ideas, competing tools actually come up. And hopefully, we'll see some convergence there or not. If there's, they keep, we keep having competing um, ideas. So chaos engineering is not going to go away. So let, can we have a look at how we're going to um, put it in place, or how we're going to build up to using uh, Kubernetes, uh, of, um, Kubernetes or, or chaos engineering? Um, those other platforms are available. Uh, how can we start looking at doing chaos engineering? Uh, first of all, I would like to take a step back and go to my molecular biology background. Um, also in the world of, um, of COVID, of, uh, a lot of emphasis now is on biology. And what you're looking at is, well, it's, it's a sample. But um, let's, let's imagine this is a, a figure that people uh, definitively proved that uh, COVID is real, COVID. Um, we can detect it. We can detect the proteins. Um, and of course, this is something that gets published in a peer review uh, uh, journal. And people will have seen this. People will have reviewed this. So it actually, in the, this is the stuff that, again, shows up at the other end. But when you start practicing, uh, this is actually one of mine. When I started to learn the technology uh, of uh, electrophoresis, which is basically a way of separating proteins, um, you know, experiment one doesn't look good. And that's that's built in. So we need to create an environment where it's fine to test things. It's fine to fail spectacularly, um, but build up to basically knowing, having a bag of tools, having a bag of known ways of fixing problems, and a known way of looking at bigger problems and dividing them into smaller tools that we know. So a bigger problem like COVID is not going to be fixed in one experiment. It's, it's thousands. I know of, um, of uh, the COVID vaccine that was developed here in the Netherlands. That's, um, that's not just one person doing it. I know it's around 1,000. So it takes a thousand people doing multiple, multiple experiments. But what they did is they looked at the problem of COVID and broke it down into um, problems that they know to fix with certain technologies. And that's why we can now see that COVID vaccines are actually coming out at a spectacular rate, um, about 5x faster than they ever uh, released a vaccine. And that's just because they knew what kind of problems to break it down into. But if you have a close look at the spectacularly nice uh, gel, this is um, an overview of, step, yes, as I said, protein separated by size. Um, we'll have marker, known markers on the left. Um, 
will have a, a positive control, will have a negative control. And that's all to satisfy our peer reviews uh, reviewers. Uh, when we when you submit an article with sample data to your uh, to a, a magazine, they're just not going to publish it outright. What they're going to do there's going to be a review panel, and the review panel will have um, will be given time to review not just your document but actually the raw data. So what they'll do is actually go back in and see if your experimental design makes sense, and it makes sense in the sense that is it statistically relevant. Um, showing something once is not uh, uh, it's not proof. If you can prove it multiple times, and then we need to calculate, you can actually statistically calculate how many times we need to show this proof. Um, what kind of negative controls do we have? Because uh, we can actually see these lines here on the uh, on the gel, but that might not actually be the protein we're looking for. So can we cut it out? Can we have another uh, test to look for the uh, for the protein? Could we? Um, have a negative control. So can we, because these proteins are probably dissolved in something, so that might be um, have impurifications. So we need to check if the uh, we're seeing impurifications instead of the actual protein we're looking for. Um, are they actually separated enough? Because here there's a couple of bands that I would like to see separated a bit more. Because um, it might be one protein uh, bleeding out, it, or it could be two proteins that just have a similar size. Um, and was a gel separation actually the, the correct tool to begin with? As I said, a band on a gel is not necessarily the proof we're looking for. The proof is that, is it the protein we have? So there's, uh, there's other techniques to use. So was the experiment uh, the right experiment to begin with? That, to begin with? And that's something these reviewers will look at. And uh, magazines or art journals will make sure that the panel is representative. You'll have uh, someone that is uh, will be in your technically or philo philosophically in your corner, but they'll often definitely also invite people that are on the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, the reviewer number three is always a pain because they are the ones that will go look uh, really at your experiments, and that make that's not annoying. That makes you stronger. Although when you get a feedback after feedback of negative feedback after negative feedback, you might you know want to strangle anonymous reviewer number three. Um, but in the end, it will make your experiment stronger. So most of the time, when you come up with experiments, it's the design that matters most. Um, my initial, my first academic supervisor told me it's 99% inspiration and 1%, well, no, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So you need to think and work hard to get the result that you need. It's not going to come come easy. Um, when we translate this back to, to our field, we can start looking at game day exercises. So can we uh, take a version of our platform, perhaps not prod, um, and can we apply real pressure? Because nothing uh, is worse than, uh, nothing survives uh, a, a real, um, real or, or unexpected usage of your platform. Um, this is a picture of the Decoma Narrows Bridge uh, in the USA. It was a really cool bridge when you build it. The only thing you didn't think of was that the bridge actually had the same uh, resonance as uh, which was generated by about wind of gale force four. So it was a nice bridge. It worked well for four months, and then it started. Uh, the first uh, wind season came in and actually this got destroyed. So what we also need to have is a platform that we are not in it. Uh, we're not afraid to destroy completely. And when we look back at, uh, at sports, how do they do this? They actually go back and they come up with experiments or not necessarily experiments, but they'll review the outcomes. So we'll do an experiment and we need to review the outcome. This is a, a picture of, of a of a movie called Moneyball, which is based on a real life story of a team, a baseball team that basically um, hired uh, new players based on statistics instead of gut feeling, which was which was the way p stuff was done before. So not only do you need to come up with experiments, but we need to review the results in the end. 
Um, if we start slow, so we're not going to do chaos engineering straight away, but we can start building up. So we'll have to have a, a version of our platform that we can inject some form of not, uh, failure into. I really like the tool called Toxy Proxy, which came out of Shopify, which um, is, as the name says, it's a proxy server that you can set up to do nasty things, like in, induce uh, timeouts, uh, respond wrongly, uh, respond out of sync. Um, and then we can actually, since we um, now all do Docker, 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 and not necessarily Kubernetes, but also it also works on platforms like uh, HashiCorp's Nomad. Um, can we, you can set up your platform in such a way that you have a toxic proxy um, sidecar. And in my case, I've, I've run several experiments on, on HashiCorp, uh, on Nomad, where the entry point is no longer the original application, but the entry point is the, side, the toxic proxy sidecar. And that's the port we expose, and we then inject the failures into our platform. Um, since it's Nomad, it's all, it has a console service mesh, so I do some tagging and actually know which, um, which uh, applications or which version of the application or which instance of the application are, are running Toxy Proxy and which ones have Toxies uh, involved. And that way, I can do. Um, non-destructive game day exercises where we experiment. For instance, like can, what happens if you block the DNS board? What happens if um, one of the microservices, let's say the authentication servers, is really slow? Uh, what cascading failures are we seeing in the platform? If we uh, summarize what we've seen so far, there's a couple of things that we can learn from the other professions. Uh, so from athletes and musicians, we'll, we'll know that practice may makes perfect, right? Remember, we need 10,000 hours to get good at something. Um, pre and post game um, an analytics will point out the options where we can adjust, where we can win. Um, when we take that a bit further to pilot doctors and firemen, basically jobs that have very severe outcomes at the end, um, we'll know that people respond differently under stress. So uh, some people will freeze up, some people will actually lead, and that's something we can train. Um, but we need to make sure that it's lifelike simulations um, for it to be um, really useful. Because um, there's nothing weirder than the human mind where basically we, if we know something is, is not critical will respond differently. So we need to make sure that the, the simulations we run are as lifelike as possible. And we need to, um, we know that using checklists will actually save our, our ass. Well, in our case, that will probably translate to run books. Uh, from scientists, we know that we can break down big problems into small problems that we know the solution to. Um, and of course, lies, damn lies, and statistics and um, biases. So biases are. Um, a way to really screw yourself. And that's what something what the, also the, the reviewers will look for is we, if you do the experiments, it's probably a multi-year process. So when you feel like an, a result is there, and that's something you want to prove, not necessarily is there, but it's because you want it to be there. And we also have learned that experimental designs matter. Um, that's all minor fancy. But checklists are incredibly boring. So we need to make this a little bit more sexy to make it work for our work of, um, line of work. Um, when we translate stuff that we've discussed so far is basically we want game, uh, game day exercises. We want destruct, well, we begin with non-destructive, but we actually want to build up to destructive tests, which means that we need to really quickly be able to rebuild our, our platforms, which means that we need to have configuration management in place. We need to have infrastructure code in place. We need to actually need to have um, the initial runbooks in place that we kicks our stuff with. Because if you remember not too long ago, um, at OVH, you had an unfortunate event where an entire uh, campus burned down. And that's one of the scenarios that I, I 
personally want to practice and I've been practicing with my my staff um, and then you find out that there is a certain order stuff needs to be uh, started in or you need to have a couple of secrets in place before uh, you can build out the rest of the uh, your infrastructure so that's one of the scenarios you can you can test uh, but if you don't want to make if you don't want to have this be a multi-week process, but more like minutes or hours, then we need to have that's one of your 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 initial game day exercises to run. And for that, we also need to have observability. What we now, of course, call observability observability tools in place. What we used to call monitoring. Uh, so we need to have metrics. We need to have logs. We need to have traces, and not just metrics and logs, but we need to have relevant metrics and logs and traces, and we need to be able to interpret um, the stuff we see on the screen. So we don't no longer want vanity um, vanity dashboards. No, it's, it's the tool that we use to make sure that we you know, stay in control and stay ahead of the curve. And if we really want to go full tilt, we want to go you know, introducing breaking production on purpose. So we want to have something like a chaos monkey running around and pulling wires. But that's only when we have conf we've ha built up enough confidence that we actually have uh, we can survive um, someone pulling the plugs. And there's a couple of things that we need to build up to. Basically, um, so far, uh, well, at least the places I've worked, we've never things like testing, uh, monitoring. It's, there's, it's hard uh, to find money, place, time, resources to get this in place. But if we, uh, so we need to find a way to gain the system that we find this uh, this time, this place, these resources actually start doing this so that we can convince the management that failure is normal and expected behavior, but that we can have uh, our processes in place, we have our monitoring in place, we have um, our resources in place to deal with it, and we've had a, an architecture that also can deal with it. So a node drops out, half a data center drops out, not a problem, because we've designed it this way. We actually test it this way. There's not just an ISO point somewhere in a big fat Excel sheet that says so, no, we've tested it. And that's how you can game the system, basically by saying, uh, we have an ISO certification um, for which we need to produce a certain amount of evidence. So I'm going to produce the set uh, evidence by doing game day exercises. And that allows engineers basically to be scientists. They need to uh, feel comfortable uh, coming up with tests, experiments, hypotheses um, to do experiments. Not only come up with them, think of what outcomes they are most likely to see or would like to see, um, converse about um, the setup. Is it the experiment we're going to run, is that is that going to give us the outcome we're going we're gonna to have, what well, we, we want? And also, in the end, it will translate basically in if we do a test, we need to observe the results. So it will also improve our monitoring. Um, and it will give our engineers a place to be comfortable with failures. Um, because as I said, um, we train pilots, we train doctors, we train firemen to expect failure or, and to uh, respond to it. Whereas most of the time when I've worked in places, um, there's very little time to get stuff in place. And so we only optimize the happy path. We will never look too far into the, the, the failure paths until stuff actually breaks in production. And that's something we can need to catch before so we can have uh, procedures in place which is actually the next step. So when you're pressured by an architect or a CTO or CEO to do push something new in, into production, we actually can push back saying, we need to have certain runbooks in place that we um, 
be able to not just deal with the, the happy path. Now we also need to have runbooks in place for the failure path. And the failure path is stuff we do experiments for. Because when we set the new Kubernetes up, whenever the new version out comes out, or whatever, then we replace Kubernetes next, we can do these runbooks. We can also have a realistic definition of done. Um, set up so that we can put our juniors into our on call rotation instead of just the seniors that you know um, gain the experience not by being trained but basically by being thrown into the deep end and having survived for the 20 30 years they've been around and basically not having burned out at that point and that's a very sad um, selecting pool I would say so I think we should turn it around and make sure that we are proud to have run experiments, that we've seen failure, but recovered from failure, and not just production. We need, eventually it's gonna happen in production, but when it does happen in production, and you're gonna basically be called out of your bed at the most inconvenient time possible, um, that you have the unconscious subroutines in place that will actually guide you to take your your checklist that will guide you to look at the, the the problem as a whole and break it down into smaller problems. Um, I probably recognize the failure that's already going on or a version of the failure that's going on. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm hoping I'm within the uh, allocated time slot. Um, if you want to talk to me, um, you can email me, you can yell at me on, on, on Twitter, and on, in the end, if you want to revisit my slides, I'll make sure it's going to be all uploaded to SlideShare in a minute. And if you have any further questions, uh, we might be able to discuss it here, or I'll be on floor 10 in the uh, virtual world.